Aloha. Well, welcome to American Issues, take one. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is China-USA Relationship Falling Apart. You know, China's been in the news a lot lately, and um, not all good news. But nevertheless, uh, we've heard recently from the FBI director, and That's he's right. basically saying that there is a possibility or is a likelihood that the COVID-19 virus escaped from the Wuhan uh, virology lab in China. And then, of course, we had the stories of the balloon, the Chinese balloon over Montana, and eventually shot down. And now we're dealing with stories about uh, the possibility of China supplying lethal weapons and ammunition to Russia in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, we have a lot of other things that have been um, in the news about China, so we're going to discuss that and what does it all mean. With me is my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Good morning. Good morning, Tim, Jay. Jay, what's your take on some of the uh, recent news events that we're hearing about China, be it weapons to Russia potentially, or um, the announcement from the FBI director that uh, maybe the COVID-19 came out of their, their lab in Wuhan, or... Um, you know, other stories that we're, we're seeing and hearing about. You know, I break them down in two parts, Tim. Uh, some parts, you know, that China is in charge of, of that issue. For example, Hong Kong, you know, and other, you know, other countries in the periphery of China. It's, it, and, and Taiwan, of course. Um, China controls that news. It controls those initiatives. Um, other things, um, you know, come from the State Department or from agencies here in the United States. And so you really wonder, um, you know, what's generating all this heat? There's a lot of heat lately. I mean, we, we could do without the heat. But as a matter of fact, the military is building up. As a matter of fact, uh, there is uh, more heated rhetoric. And I'm not sure why exactly. Uh, maybe we're trying to face them down. Um, maybe we think we need to do that now. Maybe we think that um, they're getting cl too close to Russia and uh, and Russia is, um, you know, fomenting this sort of an anti-American uh, viewpoint in China in terms of uh, foreign policy. Um, but I think I think even with the two kinds of uh, heat sources, if you will, um, there's there's more heat now, and um, there's more trouble between the United States and China. And the fact is, you know, many columnists have written about this. Uh, we are interdependent on them. Now, we need them for a lot of things in our consumer world, in our military world, for that matter. And I, I'm not sure it's a good idea. Uh, those who say, and there are people who say this on the Russian side, too, that we really have to make all efforts uh, to, make, to make a better relationship, a peaceful relationship, to take down the heat with China. Um, you know, that's a pretty you know, persuasive suggestion. Um, you know, they may not be realistic about it. If this is coming from China, if China is being more aggressive, building up its navy, um, developing its nuclear arsenal, um, pushing on its neighbors, um, and uh, various other things, uh, in including diplomatic interconnections around the world with our enemies, um, you know, then I don't know if we have all that much control. So, you know, it's a confused situation in my mind right now. Um, I only see the heat, and I worry about the heat. And I worry about the heat in juxtaposition with all the trouble that's going on in Eastern Europe. Um, we are entering a new phase. And I, I, I hate to use this term, but it almost sounds like it's a soft World War III, uh, where everybody is uh, adverse to everybody and, and taking sides and developing weapons and making threats. And China's part of that. All right. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Chuck, you know, I... I recall the days when uh, we were watching the Olympics and those Olympics were being held in China. So clearly China cares a great deal about its public image, its world image. Uh, these news stories of, of China's activities, uh, do they care? Uh, or are they concerned about their image and want to do something about it? Well, it's a great question. And following from the really good context that Jay just laid out, I'd step back and say, okay, if you care about your image, do you want to control your branding, control the fashioning of that image, the perception of that image? Or, or do you want to 
try and please people with that image and satisfy their values and stuff. I, I think one of the things that's been most consistently characteristic and strong about China's image is they make it, they break it. You know, it doesn't mean necessarily that they don't care what anyone in the world thinks of them. Of course, they care about the relationship to the extent that it connects with or influences economic or political or military or other transactional relationships and exchanges. But I think if if you look at one of the things that as a conflict resolution guy, that's what I do for a living, have exclusively for the last nine years or so, and before that for another 25 plus, it, you can either let conflict become the priority and the tone setter and the image maker for your relationship, or you can look for collaborative topics, subjects. I'm going to give one example affecting China. If you took China's greatest scientists, and they have some of the best in the world, on ocean-related and seabed-related items and the environmental and mineral and scientific components of those, and the best U.S., French, Australian, British, Western scientists, and you put them together and said, your job is to craft a coordinated understanding, research, exploration, management, development, and collective sharing for mutual benefit, for global benefit, of all the resources and factors related to what some call the South China Sea, some call the East Sea, the Philippines have another name for. How much different might that collaborative approach to understand, manage, and share resources be for mutual benefit? Wouldn't it benefit everybody more? Of course. I mean, it's hard to imagine how it would not. Of course, but you know what? You know, can I add this? And I forgot to mention it in my in my comments. Uh, you know, remember the sand pebbles. Uh, remember, I, I forget the, the words in Mandarin, but it's a stand up China, stand up. Um, you know, we are tired of um, you know being o oppressed and um, you know these imperialist imperialist forces have undermined us for hundreds of years. We're tired of that, and we're standing up. And and what we see now is part of that same stand-up process. And it's uh, it's competition. It's we don't really want to collaborate unless it works in our favor. Um, we're not into um, world peace. We're not into uh, the, you know, the betterment of world society. We want to, are you ready? Are you writing this down? We want to win. We want to show that our system is the best in the world, that our people are the best in the world, uh, that we come out on top. Um, and that's what really counts. So we'll, yeah, we'll do business with you. Yeah, we'll we'll trade with you, uh, and and we'll invent things, and we'll use and take your inventions. But at the end of the day, we want to win, and that's what's happening now. And it seems to be speeding up. It seems to be mm, you know more aggressive now. And and the question is, what what drives Xi Jinping to be more aggressive now? But I think the mission, you know, the driver is still the same as it was 20 years ago. We want to win. We want to win against the United States. Uh, we want to bring them down off their hill, city on a hill. Um, we want to be better in every way. We want to you know, sort of dominate by, by intimidation, because intimidation is, is core uh, in, our, in our foreign policy. It, it is consistent with winning. Stand aside, boys. You know, China is coming. Watch mm -hmm. out. And, and I think that's what we're seeing now. So, Jay, let me ask you something. Um, maybe it's just me, but I, I think there was a correlation 
of some of these things China has been up to that were appear to be adversarial to a relationship. Uh, and that all started to happen when um, there was the tariff war between the United States and China. Do you see any correlation to that time period uh, in the Trump administration to where we now sit with our relationship with China? Well, that's a really interesting question, Tim. No kidding. Uh, Trump got in there and he, of course, disrupted our relations with China um, with his, you know, he loves uh, Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping loves him, which was all phony. Um, and then he puts on those tariffs, which at the time I felt those tariffs were really stupid. Um, and you know what? I still feel that way, even though, uh, you know, the tariffs still exist. Um, that was not a smart way to deal with China. Nothing that Trump did with China was smart. Not a thing, not a thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, you know the, the Chinese view of this would be, okay, it's a problem, but it's also an opportunity. Let's move into the vacuum. Um, and, and I think they kind of relished Trump's stupidity and mistakes. Um, I, don't, I don't think the, uh, we all know that the, tar the tariffs didn't do any good at all. And frankly, they're not doing any good now. And yes, they aggravate um, the Chinese, but they also aggravate American industry and agriculture. So I'm not sure where that fits in what I was saying before. I, I can only say that Trump didn't help. And right. maybe all of the Trump administration was a sidecar on this and um, was irrelevant in the long term. Hey, Chuck, same question to you. And also, I'm going to add a question, and that is, do you buy off on the title of this show? Are we in a more adversary relationship with China? Um, is the relationship falling apart? So first question is, uh, any correlation to the tariffs and our relationship with China? And second is, is the relationship falling apart? Well, you know, if you want to see where a plane is going, look at the pilot. He may have a flight plan, but if he designs and engineers and manages his own flight plan, like she does and uh, like Putin does. If he's a basically adversarial competitor and that's how he built his power is how he manages and maintains his power and expands it, that's going to be his approach. <clears throat> Trump was the best thing that ever happened to Xi and to Putin because if you want <clears throat> an adversarial competitor on the other side, out of all the U.S. presidents, you know, if I were Xi or Putin, I'd pick Trump. The guy doesn't read. The guy doesn't study. The guy hires as his advisors and leaders people who are yes men and fires anybody who's not, who happens to be an independent or critical thinker in any respect. I mean, if you want your adversary competitor <clears throat> to manifest all of those weaknesses and deficiencies, hard to design one better than Trump. And they were having a field day. You know, the terrorists are still out there, but they're not the focal item. You haven't heard either the US or China giving a lot of public attention or media coverage to any of that stuff. Yeah, it's out there, they've adjusted to that. A friend actually, was one of the lead trade negotiators with China for the Department of Agriculture. And his group's standing joke was when they go and meet with their Chinese counterparts and the Chinese would say, what's your position on this? <laughs> their answer would be, you mean now, today? <laughs> <laughs> there was no reliability, there was no consistency. Uh, there was no coherency at all, and there was no basis for it. Um, and it just, he, he's out of that now, he's doing other things. Best trade negotiator I've ever met in my life. And what a waste, yeah? You put people with those abilities, that knowledge, that expertise in the positions where they could actually have a chance to develop co collaborative relationships and bargaining and negotiating and see where, you know, where are our interests? Where are your strengths? Where are our strengths? Where might they be complementary? Mm -hmm. Do what a really good negotiator, facilitator, mediator does. We don't have anybody doing that. 
how let me, many let me... political leaders do we have who have any understanding of what conflict resolution and that kind of negotiative, collaborative negotiation really is? Let me interject a question. Is it, you know, the Biden administration has now been in, in play for two, two years, two plus years. Uh, is it time for the Biden administration to look at these existing tariffs that uh, strain the relationship and um, maybe p- potentially uh, negotiate them away? What do you think about that, Chuck? I, I go back to look at the areas where the most potentially damaging harmful conflicts are. Uh, look at the areas where each side has strengths. There may be differences in those strengths, uh, but they're able to coexist. It may be economically, it may even be politically in some areas, things like that. Look at those. Bring those to the table. Focus on those. If tariffs become a subject of negotiations where mutually beneficial, possibly complementary interests eh, may be able to be given priority, okay, fine. If tariffs have a role in that, use those to promote and to nurture those collaborative, mutually beneficial trade-offs, whether okay. it's in tariffs, whether but we're, it's in, we're not in ocean a... resources. No, we don't have people who do that. And yeah, they don't. we don't have that going on. You know, and, and uh, I, last... I take your point, Tim, uh, that the tariffs are definitely a trade-off uh, in the right context. And we have to be at the table, and the tariffs have to be one of the pieces on the chessboard. Uh, and then, you know, they have value, and we can trade them for something else. But we're not at the table, really. We're not in that collaborative discussion. Uh, we're not trading pieces, and the tariffs are irrelevant. So, you know, it seems to me that, um, you know, it's not the right time to give them away. Uh, and we have to set up the chessboard so that it's the right time to play to play those pieces. Um, and what I find interesting is that, you know, the, the mistakes, the lack of attention uh, that Trump paid to China you know, I mean, Obama talked about a pivot back in, you know, the early part of the of the aught years there, uh, maybe the later part of the aught years, and uh, he was going to pivot to China. But we got distracted, okay, and we didn't really follow through on that. I'm sorry. We should have. It would have been better. Um, and then we made all these uh, mistakes, mistakes in, you know, uh, Trump's time and also mistakes in Biden's time, uh, which which gave China the opportunity that it needed to advance on us. A lot of the things on the long list of, you know, what are the 15 things or more that you gave to discuss in this show um, are uh, examples of things that China has done because of the vacuum. If China sees an opportunity, if China sees us faltering in some way, China's going to move right in because as I said before, you know, their basic and really uh, primary uh, rule in this game is to advance on the United States, to be ahead of the United States. Every every time we falter, that's a great opportunity for them. They've had a lot of opportunities, and they're taking advantage yeah. of them more and more. Yeah. And I would say that you know it may it may look like uh, to answer your primary question, um, you know, uh, what is China's uh, China U.S. relationship falling apart? I'm not sure that you can say it's falling apart. We're declining, and they are moving into the vacuum. Mm, so a lot right. of the things on your list of you know troubled uh, frictions, okay, are really an example of uh, uh, situations where the United States have has left them a vacuum and they have moved into it. Great point. Um, let me ask you a question here, but before I do, let we'll go down the list on a few of these items very quickly. Uh, China's crackdown of democracy in Hong Kong. Of course, the Chinese spy balloon uh, issue that uh, recently was resolved by shooting it down. Uh, the open partnership agreement with Russia in October 2022. Of course, we talked about the trade tariffs, past computer hacking. That's um, uh, incidents that have occurred. The human rights violations uh, that China is conducting. Um, these are just some of them. So the question is this. Uh, I think it was a Ramson poll that was recently taken and um, 49% of Americans think China is our number one threat to the United States. That's up four times from 2020. Uh, is that concern warranted? Is the, the polling that 
recently been conducted. Is, are those numbers warranted? Are you asking me? Yes, Jay. Now, this is an example of how the government, the State Department, and the Biden administration um, puts out news, uh, perhaps very likely with the intention of trying to uh, flex muscle against China. Um, and, and, and they do that um, uh, partly in order to get people excited, to get public opinion to run against China. And it, it's easy to do that. It works. I don't want to use the term propaganda, but if they keep on pumping out bad news about China, then you're going to get a result on a poll like that. If they pumped out good news on China, that you know it wouldn't be happening that way. Um, and I and I am troubled, honestly, with uh, you know, the government trying to manipulate public opinion so that uh, they intimidate China by by polls and the like, uh, where uh, the American public seems to be against China. Um, and I I don't think that's a right the right way to do foreign policy. Um, I, I think um, I think it's a mistake. I Great think point. they have to come up come up with something that's more mm, more nuanced, uh, more thoughtful uh, than trying to whip up public opinion. Seems like a clumsy clumsy approach, Chuck. Uh, in the same vein as uh, uh, Jay has just discussed, um, China owns about nine hundred billion dollars worth our treasury debt. Um, these, to Jay's point, these strategies that kind of put China in a bad light. Um, is that is that some way uh, a good idea, considering that China doesn't have to renew their treasuries when they mature? Well, first, I want to endorse Jay's point and insight. And much as I hate to say it in his presence, he, as usual, is, is spot on. I, I mean, the approach that we've been taking has been kind of like we took with the balloon. I mean, if you want to find out what that balloon was really doing, you don't shoot it down with a Sidewinder missile. And that's like opening a pistachio with a hammer. Yes, you will crack the shell. You will not have an edible result. Give me a break here, right? So, and I think that crosses over to your question. So think about it. Let me throw it back to you. Oh, what does that tell you about what's wrong and missing with our approach? And I'll add one more thing in there uh, over on the South China Sea. South China Sea has been there for eons, for centuries. Nobody before China had come up with the idea, hey, take these little rocky outcroppings, build them up, accrete them, and turn them into mini islands with military installations on them and claim them, right? You don't have to take over the Spratleys or the Paracels. You surround them with rocky outcropping military yeah. bases. I, I got a better idea. Why don't you just turn them into casinos? They'll be well well populated and, and, and visited. Don't forget Hainan Island. They're too close Island. to Hong Kong. <laughs> they would compete. And That's Macau. right. They would compete with Hong Kong. That's true. Yes. Very good point. Hey, um, Chuck, should the Biden administration, I mean, it, you know, in one in one report we have, you know, China about ready to uh, supply Russia with uh, lethal weapons and ammunition. Yet, on the other hand, China announces a 12-point peace plan to Ukraine. To what degree should the Biden administration pay heed to that 12-point plan and uh, maybe pay attention to it? Well, first of all, it's not our call. Hey, there's one thing that President Biden has consistently said that's pretty hard to argue with. Ultimately, hey, the fate of the Ukraine and the terms and conditions of any negotiated end to the war in the Ukraine, that's their call. We've chosen to back them up. Yeah, but we're in a proxy war up to our necks right now. And is it really only their call? No, but it's not ours. And it's not. Well, our it is place. our de facto, Chuck. I mean, we, you know, there's a couple yeah. of articles in the paper this week about how people in Congress, um, a lot of people in Congress, including Democrats, are getting soft on supporting Ukraine. And if they do that, they're, you know, they're engaging in that kind of proxy. Um, and, and we have a tremendous amount of influence because of our dollars uh, and our weapons. 
Um, so if, if we if we tell Ukraine, you know, we're not going to give them or we're going to give them more, um, that has a huge effect on Ukraine's decision process. But I'd like to add one thing about China. You know, it, it, it really should be it, sh- it should be rejected. Why? Because they got their hand around Putin anyway. They're in an embrace with Putin. So, you know, their 12 point plan is, is not without conflict. They are conflicted up to their eyeballs. Uh, we can't trust them on that. Who would ever trust them on that? You know, we have to see the reality. It's like when Putin gets up there and says, I want to make peace. You know he's lying. And you know the Chinese have got an agenda. Um, they're not a, a, a fair witness on this at all. You know, Jay, it's interesting. I, I know we're not talking about Russia right now, but your point about China has their, you know, their hand around Putin's throat. Um, you know, you have to remember if Russia was so uh, concerned about their image as a world power, Yet they had their, you know, their hand, their they were handed uh, a defeat uh, in the initial part, and still today uh, of the Ukraine conflict. Um, to what degree does it say to the world that we need ammunition and weapons from China? Uh, doesn't that just amplify or put a spotlight on their their weakness, military military weakness? My answer is yes. What do you think, Chuck? Yeah, I think. Yes, but because you have to remember that <clears throat> China's image fashioning and presentation is always multifaceted. <clears throat> and the focus the media has given is the focus China wants. It's not on what aid are they providing, how lethal and dangerous <clears throat> and supportive of Russia's war is it, but <clears throat> what's the relationship between China and Russia? <clears throat> And China has managed that relationship and the media coverage and perception of it publicly, I I think about as well as it's possible to do, given exactly what Jay just inferred is, you know, their arms are not only around each other, but their hands are each in each other's pockets and maybe other places south of the belt. Who knows? So, (laughs) yeah. You know, you know, when they get up and say we're going to a family get... show, so we don't want to go yes, there. It, yeah, well, I, I think <laughs> is this a family show? I didn't know that. It used to okay. be a family show. Uh, <laughs> you know, when they when they when they talk about lethal weapons, they talk about their you know support of Russia. It's it's not because they actually are going to provide the weapons, or the weapons make that much difference. Is they're really talking to us? They're not. They're not talking. You know, uh, to the world. Well, I suppose they're talking to the world. They're not. It's not what it seems to be. There's always, as you suggest, there's multiple levels of communication going on. And one of them, probably the primary one, is mm, the U.S. can't handle this. We can step in and handle it. The U.S. can't keep Congress together. Um, the U.S. can't keep uh, the EU and NATO together. More and more stories about that. And we're going to step in and we can command the field here. Uh, not by doing it, but by suggesting we can. All righty. Uh, Chuck, where does our relationship with China go from here? Um, what are some of the points that could be um, ironed out that improve the relationship with China? I'll go back to the example of the South China Sea. Mm-hmm. If the U.S. and China could agree to put together their best scientific and ocean resources and environmental people to see if there might be a way to develop a collaborative plan to research, understand, manage, and allocate the resources for benefit beyond just the U.S.'s and China's. To me, that's a classic example of where there is an incredible opportunity for mutual benefit and global benefit going to waste because the leaders have chosen to engage in adversarial competition on exactly as Jay says, a win-lose basis. Yeah. You know, your comment reminds me of the 70s when the United States and Russia decided to take joint efforts in our space exploration. Uh, Good point, Chuck. Thank you. Jay, uh, to you, where do we go from here with uh, U.S.-China relations? And what, in your opinion, might be um, an area of which we can improve those relationships? Well, the first part of the question is, where do we go from here? Which is a sort of a, fact, a, sort of a factual uh, perspective. And, and that is, I think it gets worse. 
that's that's likely to happen uh, during the Biden administration. And and uh, if a Republican gets into office in 2024, it'll be worse yet in 2024. And it may very well lead to a, a low grade or a high grade war um, with nuclear weapons and all that. Uh, and, and that will be very damaging to the United States, whether that war takes place in Asia or in Europe. Um, where should it go from here? Uh, I, I take Chuck's point. It should go to the table and it should be a sophisticated, comprehensive, you know, well thought out plan, which it, I'm sorry to say it is not that. It is not that now. It certainly wasn't that during the Trump time. I'm not sure that it was that during the Obama time. Um, but we really have to, you know, use our muscle, whatever muscle we have, which is, you know, not quite clear these days. We have to use our muscle as a way to get to that table and talk turkey so that both parties benefit. Uh, if we can do that, I think we can reach the Chinese because that would be consistent with their their wish to win. They'll see it as a competition, as a global game. And um, we should see it that way, too. Um, we should we should be meeting them at the table. Uh, and, and that would be the rational approach. But it takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of good foreign policy. It takes a lot of good people. It takes a government that can follow through so they don't change their position every Tuesday. Um, so uh, the likelihood of getting there, Tim, I'm not so sure, but that's where it should go. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we've run out of time. So Chuck, your last thoughts on this topic. Yeah, I just to follow on Jay's great insight, the choice of the people at the table is going to become increasingly important. If we get people who have built and demonstrated and bring to the table exceptional strength to understand and work collaboratively with the Chinese strategists, and they do that as well, the opportunity for exactly what Jay is talking about becomes possible. If we don't, we're going to go exactly where Jay says we have been going and are going. <clears throat> the competitive adversaries are going to continue beating on each other to no one's benefit. Great. Love Certainly it. not the people's. And a friend left me with <clears throat> a thought that I think is worth sharing, and it's short. He said, look, Chuck, if you want to understand Asian strategy and thinking, look for, respect, and understand that which is not said and not there more than that which is said and is there. Yeah, Great comment. Good. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. Jay, your last thought. Thoughts, yeah. <laughs> my, my last thought is that we are talking today about you know U.S.-China relations, but right now in the world, they are inextricably intertwined with what is going on in Europe. And to the extent the U.S. succeeds in supporting Ukraine, to the extent that Ukraine succeeds in, in staving off the Russians, to the extent that the EU and NATO stay together, none of these things are clear right now, actually, um, then we have greater authority, uh, greater leverage, greater influence on the world stage. Huge, huge amounts of influence if, if we prevail there. OK, and if we lose there, if we don't support Ukraine, if the EU, NATO come apart and uh, Putin takes Ukraine, we don't look so good. And our influence on the world stage is seriously diminished, uh, leaving China to rule the field, leaving China to find all kinds of new opportunities to undermine us. So we had really better get our act together on Ukraine. All right. We've run out of time, but I want to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, for their very sage and wonderful comments and suggestions. Thank you. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and I'd just like to say aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.